Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome. We're about to get started in a few minutes. People just finishing their afternoon falafel, putting on some cartoons for the children to keep them quiet. While we're waiting to start, as always, could you say who you are and where you are from in the question and answer box? Thank you. Hello, Hend. Hello, the Yemen. Hello, Tunisia. If you're just joining us, a very warm welcome. We're going to get started in a few minutes um, while we're waiting for people to join. If you could put your name and where you're from in the question and answer box, give us a shout out. Hello, Shahar. Egypt, hello. Kingdom Saudi Arabia, hello, good afternoon. Raham, glad you could join us. Hello, Bahrain, Riyadh, hello there. The Lebanon, Zakia, hello. OK, and our dear colleague Hannah from the Yemen. Hello, Hannah. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Just waiting for people to join now. Um, while we're waiting, if you could give us a shout out. Who are you and where you are from? Hanan, hello. Haifa, hello. Very good that you're with us. Hello for, for the Yemen as well. Rana Ahmed from Iraq. Hello, Ahmed. Lebanon, Saudi, Yemen. OK, then I think we're about ready to start now. So brilliant that you're with us this afternoon. We've got a great program for you, of course, as always. My name's John, John Shackleton. I work for the British Council and I look after our teacher development work in the Middle East and North Africa region. As usual, I'm joined by my dear colleagues, Nora al Saba from Bahrain and Temar Shora from Egypt, who's keeping me company here in the lovely city of Cairo. We also hope to be joined by a new addition to our family, Asil from Oman, um, who will hopefully be joining us to deliver a regular and new feature called Have Your Say, that we hope will be a regular spot within the Ask Hala webinar and the Ask Hala webinar series. Um, the topic then, um, as you know, 
Um, we choose topics based on what it is that um, our audiences have suggested. And today we're looking at the very, very important theme of helping learners who can't get online. And I'm just going to say a few words about that before I hand over to Hala. Comments, of course, about the topic, questions, please use the question and answer box and we'll be publishing those and um, bringing them together, asking Hala for her input and adding ideas and opinions ourselves. So keep those comments coming in all the time, please. So helping learners who can't get online. We've got a, a broad interpretation of that. What, what we mean by that are, are learners that have trouble getting online because, for example, um, they have access issues. So that could be they don't have a device. It could be that they have poor connectivity. It could be that their electricity is not working. It could be something to do with the affordability of data. So uh, a number of access issues. But we also mean um, who have learners who have issues because of limited access. So there are degrees of ability to get online. Um, of course, so it could be limited connectivity. They might have to share a device. Um, they might have some data, but not much. So um, there's a, a limited uh, a dimension to what it is that we're going to be talking about. And of course, ultimately, even if they do manage to get online, are they really online? Are they really motivated to be there? Are they really learning? Are they really getting the most out of the um, online experience? So that's our interpretation. And Hala's going to be talking about some practical ways that we can deal with some of those challenges and um, helping us to identify, first of all, those learners who may have um, access issues and then to give some tips and advice and guidance about how we can help them to the best of our abilities. OK, so um, I'd like now to hand over to Halle, who I can see is expectedly waiting there, ready to answer questions. Halle. Uh, hi, John, thanks. Do you want to talk a little bit about the TNI website, the new website before we, we kick off? Oh, I do. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, we have a new um, website um, dedicated to the teacher networking initiative. There's a link there that you can see in the slide deck. So um, uh, we put all of our content that we've developed um, uh, over the, the last few months onto the website. So if you're new to the teacher networking initiative, um, please visit the website. It's a great opportunity to find out more about what we're doing. And if you've missed any of the earlier Ask Halla webinars, all of the recordings and slide decks are on our website. And if you've got friends who you know who wanted to be here with us today but can't make it, then please tell them about it too and they can watch the recording of Halla's session. Halla, thank you for that reminder. Great stuff. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks very much, John. And uh, welcome everybody to the, our second webinar in the series for this for this phase. And it's about helping learners who cannot get online. And as usual on the screen now you can see uh, the learning outcomes of today's webinar. We'll be uh, looking at uh, barriers to accessing online or digital learning content in general for both teachers and learners. And I think John has given you a, a bit of an idea now. Uh, we'll be also looking at some practical guidance on how to overcome these barriers will be tapping on what we call the digital accessibility analysis and we'll uh, be wrapping up with a couple of practical classroom techniques uh, for teaching in contexts where where access to digital resources is uh, limited so first of all let's uh, uh, explore together the current situation and let's see what the landscape uh, is like uh identifying the problem do we have a problem let's see what the data uh, says so according to the united nations education agency or the unesco 
The figures they got recently from the International Telecommunication Union was quite shocking for me at least. This is the bet that we know and this is the bet that we've, we've been talking about for a year and a half. Because of the, the school closures, uh, 1.5 billion students and almost 63 million primary and secondary teachers are affected by the school disruption. In the wake of the pandemic in 191 countries, this is the bet that almost everybody knows, right? The bet that was really shocking and I don't think everybody knows it is that half of this number the 1.5 billion students, which is a big, big number like in history, half of, of those students who are studying at home because of the school closure do not have access to a computer. OK, so half of the people who were forced to stay at home because of the school closure, the students do not have a computer at home to use. Moreover, 40% of those students, of the 1.5 billion students, do not have internet access at home. So you can see now that there is a problem. It's not only the school disruption, it's not only the school closure, closures and the class stopping, it's not only 1.5 billion students studying at home, it's almost half of them either have no computer at home to use or have no internet access. The problem really when it comes to the Middle East and North Africa, the problem is bigger than what I've just said. The majority affected, the majority of this half, this disadvantaged half, actually is located in the southern half of the globe, what we call the global south. OK, because the internet penetration and by internet penetration, we mean internet access, people who can access the internet. So internet access and the use in this hemisphere, in this southern half of the globe is limited and low by default in normal situation. So you can understand now, you can imagine the situation after COVID and here is a map actually. This map is released uh, uh, recently in April this year and you can see here that the unconnected populations they call they call the, the, the countries highlighted uh, on this map the unconnected populations and it simply shows the countries with low or unstable internet connection and guess what? Exactly. The majority of the countries that have problem with internet connection is based in the southern half of the globe, which our region is basically there, the Middle East and North Africa. So you, so you can see from the map that the biggest numbers, the largest numbers are in the south, in the southern half of the globe, not the north. So this, this gives you a sense of how big the problem is. So we close the schools. There is no way to learn except remotely. So students and the parents are dealing with this new remote learning situation. They, they need a computer and internet connection, but they don't have, they don't have that. They, they don't have access to that. We also asked our teachers a sample or a group of our teachers in the Middle East and North, North Africa, and we wanted to know what they think about this situation or the problem I presented now. Uh, is a seal around, John, you think? Um, we're still trying to get her um, get her to uh, join. She's having some technical problems, so I think um, yeah, if we if we just have a look at some of the things that she's found out um, from her um, uh, on the ground perspective, that would be good. Mm. Right, so because Asil is one of our uh, um, uh, teacher educators in, in uh, Middle East and North Africa, and she's uh, based in uh, Oman, and she had she had a discussion with her fellow teachers 
uh, about uh, 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 this uh, to today's topic, helping learners get learning online. And we've got four key findings she got from, from the teachers. Uh, she thinks or the teachers think that synchronous and asynchronous platforms together are important for effective online learning. So let's not rely on one single channel of communication. Do not use synchronous platforms all, all the time or a synchronous platform of the t all the time. Just have a combination of both to cater for the different circumstances the learners uh, have. Also, the teachers uh, were thinking about the audiovisual resources again as uh, as providing a variety of content for the learners. You can give them visual resources, visual content, but also you can give them audio content. It, it depends on how strong their Internet connection is. We use the online learning for providing instant feedback. So perhaps this is one of the perks or one of the one of the strength of learning online is that you can give instant feedback uh, using WhatsApp, video calls, etc. And perhaps the last key element is showing support. And I think this is linked to uh, uh, providing feedback uh, it can help you uh, feel connected to your learners and showing them support and showing them that you're there for them to give guidance and uh, extend the learning uh, learning time beyond the online classes. So these are the thoughts that teachers have been given a, a seal uh, around today's topic. And I think that that's um, it's it's key that that last point in particular, Ala, to do with um, you know understanding the learners. This is a general point, isn't it, that we need to do, um, of course, in order to develop lessons that are going to be effective. We need to understand our learners, and this is a, a specific and particular example, isn't it, that if learners are having trouble getting online, it's a new situation for us. I think in in many respects. So I think that initial. Um, analysis that you're going to be talking about. It talks particularly to the last point that uh, Asil raises there. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we've got a picture now from a class somewhere in the world from the global south where uh, university students are having their lessons, but in an unusual class. So you can see that the class has no uh, internet connection, it has no computers, it even has no walls. So what are the barriers to online learning? It could be the location, so it depends where your learners are and or where are you living actually because because you also need internet access, right? So we think here about urban versus rural areas where rural areas uh, are known to have less uh, internet stability than other urban uh, cities. We can think about income and the cost, and as John indicated at the beginning of the session, it could be sometimes inaffordable or expensive for some families to buy uh, data packages and, uh, and get internet access at home. Another point also we'd like to think about is the school disparity and in, in this regard we mean at the different types of schools. Are the schools public or private? Because you can imagine that the private schools can support the, the learners who pay like high fees uh, per year. They can support them with internet uh, hotspots or internet uh, channels and connectivity. But it's not the same case for the public school in the public sectors, right? Who struggle themselves with their with the technical infrastructure. The inadequate sub support. So when the parents are left with the students at home, they want to support their, their kids with learning online. But they don't but they don't know how to and if they get instructions and they try to log in online and something happens 
they get stuck. They don't know. They don't know who they should talk to. They don't know who should support them. What is there a reporting line or something? Is there a, a guidance online? Is there a tech a technician at school who can who can uh, talk to them on the phone? They 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 lack adequate support in general. Uh, the next point is also connected to the inadequate technical support. It's uh, the limited technical experience in general. So the, the, the parents are not technical experts. They are not technicians. And uh, so so are the, the, the learners, the kids themselves. So they are required now to, uh, to access online learning, but they don't have the adequate experience. And even when they try, and they get stuck, they don't have the adequate technical support. Uh, another point, and actually this point comes, comes back to the teachers. Okay, okay we lost you for a second there, Ala. No, OK, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. That was a glitch in the Internet. OK, so I was I was speaking about the uh, the two challenging or the two difficult uh, digital content. So uh, teachers or teacher educators or material developers sometimes uh, get tempted by the uh, by the advantages that technology offer for free and they design too complicated digital content for the learners to access, for the parents to deal with, and for the learners to digest and understand. So these these were the barriers to access uh, learning online. What is the impact of that? So the impact of that is is posing extra challenges on the students who don't have online learning access. So you give them homework assignments, but they can't complete that because they don't have proper internet access. And consequently, because they, they lack a proper internet connection, they cannot participate properly in the lessons. Also, they can't put their best foot forward, and this has to do with their motivation level and their potentials. They want to do their best, they have potentials, maybe they are motivated, but all of this like crashes on the rock of reality when they can't just get online. And this this point that I, I particularly find interesting and eye opening is when we force online learning and we when we force them to use strong Internet connection, they go to use inconvenient public locations to access Wi-Fi. So they might end up sitting in a cafe unattended surrounded by strangers. They might go to a library far from where they live. They might go to a public park in the evening to access a nearby Wi-Fi spot. All of all of these uh, situations pose risks on the safety of the, of the young uh, children. Also, the, the one of the challenges is that the students as well as the parents are left to make sense of content, assignments and the remote lessons in the absence of the teacher's guidance in some cases, unlike the face to face learning. And last but not least, one of the challenges is that everybody is feeling isolated, trying to learn something at home. I just wanted to uh interrupt you there if I may um, Hala just just to um, bring in some comments from the audience at this stage um, uh, our friend Hen from Tunisia for example shocking numbers um, what you were talking about in terms of the map and and the um, the location you know the, the the global south of of the, uh, the, the 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 biggest extent of the the connectivity and um, problems of getting online you know that resonates um, with him 
And also a really good question, and I think it, in a way it kind of sums up um, what, what we're talking about today um, and talks a little bit to what um, Asil has found out around variety, around different ways of reaching out um, to learners to help them get the most out of the experience. So, you know, that's a question for us. That what are <clears throat> the best ways to communicate? What are the best ways to reach out and get learners online? Right. Um, well, we'll we'll tackle those comments and those questions as as we go uh, throughout the session today. But thanks, Hendo, for your your comments. Um, here we go. So that that should answer Hens or speaks to Hens concerns. What can we do for students without internet? We'll start with, with uh, some practical tips. We'd like to get your thoughts also and the comments on, on that. So how about organizing a printable bucket and the book pickup drive? And by this point, we mean let's take let's let's make good use of the schools themselves, the schools, the premises, the photocopiers, the printers at schools. And let's make a good use of the school's location and have those as a pickup points or delivery points where you can have a, a schedule. You can schedule the parents, the name of the students or the name of the parent and a time to come to school and pick physical take home packets, papers, worksheets and even books. So we forgot a little bit about the books and the worksheets and the papers. There are still resources. They, they still exist and they st they're still a good source of learning. They are there at the schools. You can print them, photocopy them, prepare the packets and ask the parents, the families, the students to come at a certain day, certain time and collect their printable packet. So this doesn't need internet connection. And do you remember the USBs or have you forgotten totally about them? I have a funny USB. It uh, I, I couldn't find it today, so <laughs> I'm, I'm saying the same thing to myself. It, it's like the lower part of a man. It's like uh, two legs of a man and it was I, I bought it like 10 years ago and it was amazing big capacity. I could transfer data and materials from a computer to a co another computer very easily. So for, for me that my USB was was really a time and life saver, but I've totally forgotten about it and I, I relied overly on the Internet and the email exchanges and all of that. So go back to your drawer and find your old USBs take them back to schools and try to use them to transfer the data, the audio files, the videos, the worksheets, the PDF books, whatever you want from the computer, from the computer at school, perhaps to the, 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 the students' computers or the, the, the students' devices. And USBs do not need internet. This is good news, isn't it? pooling resources. So try as a teacher to curate and collect and organize resources available in in the in the surroundings or in the environment. So you know a couple of books that uh, students can borrow and uh, use at home. You know a couple of uh, you know you, a couple of files or binders where you can you and your uh, fellow teachers photocopy and make copies and distribute between each other and and the students. Put that together. Put them on in your locker at school in the library in a carton box, in a plastic box, name it, put a label in it, organize the stuff and make the resources available for your students or even your fellow teachers at school. Give students a lifeline, give them second chances. So as Hand mentioned now, it's it's shocking numbers. The problem is huge. It's not it, it's bigger than it sounds really. 
So don't be so harsh on the students when you give them assignments and the assignments require Internet and when they fail the assignments, give them a second chance. Ask them to resubmit their answers. Ask them to do the exam again. There is no harm doing this, really. It's giving them second chances, giving them sense of keeping going, being persistent, uh, increasing their motivation level, all of that. And this is something that doesn't require internet connection. This this point is also linked to the previous one. Avoid harsh punishments. So this is not the the the, the same world that we had what we used to have before COVID. If they fail an assignment, give them a second chance. If they use an internet source to find answers, that's OK. If they open the books at home to find answers or to review something before setting an exam, that is still OK. If they if they reached out to you uh, or a colleague or a parent to check some questions before the exam, that's that's also uh, acceptable. Providing scaffolding and this is linked to a seals and the teachers from Mina voices in the in the previous slide around showing support, right? So support is another word for scaffolding. Scaffolding is providing them with um, supportive tools. It's like uh, building bridges for your learners to overcome learning obstacles. So your your role now is not just the subject matter expert. Your role is a bridge builder. You facilitate learning. You take you take care of their learning and you help them overcome hardships and obstacles. And scaffolding actually can can simply mean providing them with indexes, glossaries. You can have bilingual glossaries, for example, the word and the meaning in Arabic or monolingual glossary, the word and the definition in English. You can give them sheets, formula sheets like, you know, equations, how to how to uh, form the present perfect in the question form. So you can have the uh, has or have plus the past participle form of the verb, plus the subject, plus whatever. So you can you can have a formula and and communicate this to, to them. Give them templates if you want them to do a research, if you want them to do a presentation, if you want them to summarize a text, give them a template, a framework so they can fill it in easily. This is something that I'm a big fan of, the scoring rubrics. If you want them to be really motivated, send them the criteria of assessing them, give them the rubrics uh, they need to follow if they want to get high score or 10 out of 10. Give them samples of projects and papers, show them examples, ask them to replicate the examples or follow the samples. All of these are acceptable and will be highly appreciated as as kind of support. Quite a lot Last of comments. Sorry. Yeah, Anna. sure. That's back. fine. Quite a lot of comments coming in uh, now that they kind of confirm what you're saying about the size of the problem. Ahmed, for example, in Iraq, um, he's got 50 students and only 14 of them um, uh, have an internet connection. Um, Abbas similarly writes that, um, you know, what can you do? There's no Wi-Fi connection. And that's, the, you know, what we're talking about today. today. How can you get around that problem of, uh, of uh, no Wi-Fi? Really interesting suggestion from Nadim about TV shows and yep. movies, so the yep. audio and the um, the video dimension to this is delivered through the radio or through um, the TV. And a comment about, or two comments about um, using um, printed material as well, that, um, you know, that, that we haven't forgotten about the environment in all of this either, of course, and that one of the great things about the internet is that uh, it, it, it does cut down, it gives you the possibility to cut down that. Um, the amount of printed materials that we use, but these are difficult times, aren't they? And we need to strike a balance between ensuring that learning continues and also our concern for the environment as well. 
That's a very interesting point, and there is there is a big argument about whether the internet is is actually helping us taking care of the environment or the opposite. <laughs> so uh, you know, to use the internet, you need electricity, right? And uh, we're using electricity these days more than we ever did. So there, there is a debate on whether really using the Internet helped us to protect the environment and the planet or actually caused the more damage to it. But as you said, John, it's it's a difficult situation and the people, especially in poor countries and in rural uh, areas who, who were suffering already uh, accessing a decent educational opportunities are suffering more because of depending on the the internet to provide education. So uh, perhaps printing a couple of worksheets is the only way to support them, to get them through a, an academic term or something. And thanks very much, Nadim, for your comment around uh, using uh, educational TV shows and radio shows for, for educational purposes. That's a very interesting comment that we'll be tackling today as well. The last point on this slide is uh, to be flexible. And again, this links back to uh, Asil and her group of teachers uh, point around combining synchronous and asynchronous uh, uh, platforms and using audio and visual resources. So be flexible and offer a range of options because one size fits all is not an option anymore. We are continuing our practical tips and uh, the next point is uh, uh, around being as low tech as possible. Reach out to your students the way you like. You can use your existing learning management system if you're using the Google Classroom, for example, at, uh, at school or Moodle or by email, but do not please assume that, that uh, the learners, all of them have the ability to jump into a live Zoom call with live streaming video calls. Get them involved at school, so the schools are reopening gradually and the, the students will spend some time with you face to face with the social distancing measures in place. Let's say once or twice a week, make good use of this time at school. So once you have them at school, try to use the school resources as much as you can. You can put the students in pairs, the tech savvies with the people who struggle with, the, with technology so they can support each other. Use the computer lab, use the internet connection if it's available. Use plain text instead of attachments when emailing because attachments need downloading and downloading needs a bit of speed internet. So copy and paste the text in an email rather than attaching a, a Word document or a PDF or a PPT or something. WhatsApp and the Google Forms, these are technology, but the, uh, they are actually low tech, techno low tech resources. The WhatsApp and the Google Forms, two tools that do not require super fast Internet. So WhatsApp, for example, is not like Facebook. It doesn't require as many uh, gigabytes as Facebook or uh, Google. And it's cheaper. Sometimes as in some countries, the mobile phone comes with the Internet uh, monthly plan, including WhatsApp, for example. The, in Egypt, we've got Internet packages that can give you uh, three minutes on WhatsApp, for example. So on WhatsApp, teachers can copy and paste long texts and have their students read and answer the questions. And we have a quote here from uh, one of the teachers who's been using uh, WhatsApp. Uh, she's saying she teaches English lessons through WhatsApp. She sends vocabulary and audios and asks the students to send back audios of readings or questions for her. So that's just a reminder. We've been talking about WhatsApp for, for long. Another interesting point for me personally is uh, making a transcripts of your voice, of your speech, using speech to text feature. So suppose you want to send your students an audio file with instructions for the new unit 
or instructions on how to start their mini project or instructions for the upcoming test or assignments, or you're explaining simply a concept or a grammar point or something. But you're worried that they might not be able to download the audio file or because or or the audio your audio file will consume up their data package and it'll be offline for the rest of the month. Google documents have got a feature called voice typing. It's uh, it will dictate your voice using your computer's microphone. So you say what you want as if you're recording an audio and the Google documents will transform your voice to a text, right? So you end up with a text you can save and send to your student. And to activate the voice typing option in the Google document, you go to the Google document and on the top bar, you click on tools and from the tools, you just tick the voice typing. You'll have an icon of a microphone, so you speak and the microphone transform your speaking into a text. Do we have any more comments, John, before I move on? Can you still hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I can't. Oh my hear God, you. I panicked. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just um, some comments coming in, going back to the, the points that um, we, we began with around, um, you know, the challenge of accessibility around electricity. You know, that, that uh, in, in some contexts, that's um, the major issue in terms of uh, access. Um, lots of comments coming in about um, alternatives and um, it, low resource platforms, um, Abbas talking about using posters and cards, Mariam talking about magazines, and I think that kind of reinforces the point that you were making earlier and something that Mariam has also said about being creative, so about um, using what's in front of you. Um, exactly. It's teachers to think about what the context is, think seriously about how you can um, make the best of a difficult situation and look for all sorts of alternatives, posters, cards, magazines, TV, radio, all of those things um, to, to really help. And I think also another comment from Marion, which is a good one, which is all about um, solidarity and working together, which I think we've learned how to do a lot, a lot more of um, during the, the pandemic, about nominating and suggesting um, uh, students or indeed parents who can act as some kind of uh, leader within a group to help those people, those learners who can't get online. So some really good comments coming in there. Right. And uh, I like the, the point around uh, Mariam's point around magazines and postcards and and this links to the point we made earlier around pooling resources. So collect all the magazines, all postcards, sort them out in envelopes, boxes, use them, make them available. Uh, I think this is going to be very useful. And back to Nadim's uh, point around using uh, TVs and radios for educational purposes. That's absolutely one thing you can direct the, the, the parents and the students to. And who says you can't learn through t TV? So I'm going to show you now a very short clip from Sesame Street, the very famous educational program that we've been watching uh, since uh, we were children. And actually in this clip, uh, Sir Ian McKellen, of course, we've seen him in, in Lords of the Rings, is teaching the Cookie Monster, my favorite character in the series, is teaching him the word resist. It's an English word, but the children doesn't, the children don't know the meaning of it. So Sir Ian McKellen is teaching him the meaning of resist. Let's watch together. Hello, I'm Ian. And me, Sir Cookie Monster. And we're here to tell you about the word resist. Yeah, resist. So please tell everyone what the word resist means, Cookie Monster. Oh, sorry, Sir Ian, but me no can do that. Why not? We have no idea what word resist mean. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah. 
Well, then, I shall tell everyone what the word resist means. Oh, boy, oh, this is exciting. Oh, what resist mean, Sir Ian? The word resist means to control yourself and stop yourself from doing something you really want to do. Yeah, I uh, may not really understand that. Well, Cookie Monster, they say there was something that you really loved. Yeah. And it pulled you towards it like some sort of powerful magnet. If you were able to control yourself and not go near it, you would resist it. Aha! So, now you understand. Not at all! <laughs> okay, well, uh... What else you got? Say there was a golden ring. Oh! And you really, really wanted this golden ring. It was like your precious. You want this ring so badly, but if you were able to control yourself and not go near the ring, you would resist it. You know, uh, me not much of a jewelry guy, so me not sure that very relevant example. Well, I see. Yeah. Well, say it wasn't a ring, and yeah. say it was a cookie. Cookie! Yes. <gasps> Chocolate chip cookie. Oh, me love cook. Now you're speaking me language. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it is golden brown yeah. and crunchy. Oh. It's filled with moist and savory chocolate chips. Oh. It does indeed look delicious, oh. doesn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy, oh, boy, me need cookie. Ah. Oh, no, no, stop, stop, cookie monster. What, what, why, why stop? Because we're telling everyone about the word resist. Yeah, so? So, resist means to control yourself and stop yourself from doing something that you really want to do. Okay, what do you point? Well, you can show everyone what resist means by not eating this cookie. <sighs> Why me pick the day to help with word? Oh, okay, okay. In name of vocabulary, me stop myself. And me resist the cookie. Splendid. Oh, oh. So, you see, Cookie Monster really wants this cookie. Oh, yeah, 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 me do. Me really do. But... So you got the idea now. Sir Ian McKellen will continue teaching the Cookie Monster the meaning of resist. Uh, Sesame Street is a, a world-known educational program and it's mainstreamed. Uh, locally in in so many countries using um, local TV channels. So that's what that's only one example. Of course, I'm sure you have um, different examples uh, in your countries specific to your TV uh, in your countries. Yeah, yeah. Me. So. Another another uh, uh, point uh, in the practical tips is to be proactive. And by this point, we, we mean you reach out to all your, your learners early and regularly and often because circumstances change. So do not, again, do not assume that because they could do the assignment last week, they would be able to do the assignment this week. Maybe they had their internet crashed or maybe their computer crashed at home or maybe electricity went off or something. So bear in mind that circumstances change and what may seem doable in week one might not be true in week four and so on. So check with, check in with them and they try to understand what they're grappling with. And this takes us actually to a very interesting uh, point a survey produced by Microsoft Forms and they call it Student Remote Learning Sentiment Survey. I call it the Digital Accessibility Analysis or the Digital Accessibility Survey, but uh, perhaps Microsoft is calling it uh, more nicely. <laughs> Student Remote Learning Sentiment Survey. I'm, I'm showing you some examples of the survey now, but we're going to put all of the materials on the microsite that that John has told you about at the beginning of the webinar. An example question of the sentiment survey is how are you feeling about remote learning currently? Do you have a reliable internet connection at home to, to, to take part in remote learning and to complete your assignments? Do you have access to a computer that is adequate for your needs, allowing you to take part in remote learning and to complete your assignments? These are only three samples from uh, the digital accessibility survey, and we'll be sharing the full survey online with you guys uh, or through the microsite. 
uh, we're moving now to the practical activities. John, do you want me to proceed or something? Well, just to say, I think really that there is some uh, chocolate chip cookies and Lord of the Rings uh, fans out there. So, uh, oh yeah, great, <laughs> great choice, Cookie Monster and uh, in Kellen. Um, yeah, and just a point from uh, Ali as well that I think again uh, brings us a little bit back to what you were saying at the beginning about um, support and about how teachers and learners and, and as you were saying, parents, you know, we're not necessarily the best placed people to help solve technical problems to do with getting online or, or, or computers, as Ali was saying. And, a, and a, a, another question about assessment, and we must do something, I think, very soon on assessment from Mohammed, who's talking about assessing writing in live classes. That's a big subject and one that we will come back to, I'm sure. Sure, yep. Um, in some countries, uh, uh, teachers uh, direct parents and families to the community resources. So if you don't have a computer at home, the teacher knows places and lists of um, organizations where you can go and uh, rent a computer, for example, or buy a computer at a cheap price or something. But you don't have to do this. I mean, it's not a part of your job, but if you'd like to do it, again, it shows how supportive you are. It comes under what we've been saying, the level of support and scaffolding and facilitating learning and the building bridges for towards education. Uh, we're moving now towards practical activities like classroom activities that you can do with your, your learners and I'm introducing you today to what we call enrichment activities. You might know this already, you might do it, under a different name, but I'd like to tell you a, a little bit more about enrichment activities, which is basically take what the children have already learned and give them opportunities to extend and apply. That's a key word here, apply that learning. Uh, the enrichment activities uh, are designed to teach the kids to think, be inquisitive, use critical thinking and above all it's a lot of fun let's watch another short video about examples like practical real examples of enrichment activities that you can do with your students and that do not need internet connection more importantly So you've seen it's using things from the student surroundings, from home, from their uh, immediate or direct environment. It needs no preparation time or effort from the teacher. It's engaging and fun. It's good for homeschooling. It's good for mass and uh, foreign language learning in general. And you've seen examples like the food, uh, the food shopping ad or the movie review, or the change, or the spare change finder, or all about my day. Lots and lots of interesting ideas that you can get the students to work on uh, math, science, English language, without any effort uh, or a lot of preparation time from your side, but also 
with using items from sur their surrounding environment. Uh, the other example today is uh, I Spy. That's another game. And it's for combining reading and grammar or reviewing reading and grammar. So whatever the reading material the students have at home, the course books, sheets, whatever they have in hand at home, the objective of this activity is to ask them to find the verbs, adjectives, adverbs in a book. So you can call it I spy or you can call it look in a book. So the sample here you can see on the screen. It, you've, you've got s simple directions or simple instructions. Choose any book you like. As you read it, find the following types of nouns. OK, then write them on the chart below. You need to provide the name of the book, the author, your name and the date. That could be a course book. It could be children's storybook. It could be a magazine. It could be a postcard. It could be newspaper that daddy is using. It could be anything from their surrounding. OK, then they need to fill in the chart with the page number. An example of a noun, a common noun, a proper noun, regular plural noun, possessive noun, irregular plural noun and so on. You can use the same activity to ask them to collect information around words with a certain number of syllables, rhyming words, anything, words that uh, items and objects with the same color, anything. So uh, in today's webinar, we've covered the barriers uh, to accessing online content, online learning, some uh, practical tips on how to overcome those barriers. We had a glance at the digital accessibility analysis or the remote learning sentiment survey. And we also ended with two practical examples uh, you can use with your learners. The uh, enrichment activities, learning from home using resources from their surrounding environment, and also I spy or look in a book activity. Uh, that's all for me now. I'll, I'll share with you three in interesting, uh, useful resources. The datareportal.com, it's where I got the map of the disturbing map of, of the global south uh, uh, with low and medium uh, 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 income countries where the, the most of the problem of, of internet accessibility lies. And the butterfly teacher where you find loads and loads of interesting activities the students can do at home with very little preparation from the teachers, but by using uh, items from their surroundings and the teachers pay teachers where you can sign up for free. It's a free account, but you can download loads of interesting templates like the one you saw on the screen. Uh, for the I spy activity or look in a book activity. There are other similar PDF templates that you can download for free and share with the students and the parents. That's all from me today. Thanks very much. Hala, OK, thank you. Just a few uh, comments and questions that have come in um, that I'd really like to share with you. And one comment that perhaps we, we can finish on um, with that uh, Mariam supplied. Um, Hend um, has demonstrated himself as a, somewhat of a poet um, with a very interesting comment that I'm going to share with you, which is, I spy with my little eye that Ask Halla webinar is reaching high. That's pretty good, <laughs> going. Yeah. Very nice, Excellent. thank you. Excellent. Um, I think what's emerged from this um, webinar, well, from the comments around this webinar, I think, is, is um, part of the ongoing theme that we often talk about, which is everything has changed and yet nothing has changed. And I think um, this word variety, um, alternatives, um, looking for different options, looking at your students, using things like the um, digital accessibility tool to really understand what you can do as a teacher in the context that we find ourselves in now, whether it's you know schools are open or, or not, whether you're using online teaching or not, 
to find the best things that are going to work that are going to work with all your students, not just the group of students that you're dealing with, but the all students, because all students, of course, are different. So I think that's a, a really good um, uh, uh, thing, I think, for all of us as practitioners to hang on to that variety, you know, meeting learner needs, of course. Um, and I think Mariam's comment um, is a really good one and sums up, I think, what we are trying to do through these webinars and through the Teacher Networking Initiative in general, that, you know, to find those alternatives, to make the best use of those alternatives, teachers need to be supported. And you've talked about two ways of supporting teachers, which I think are really important and distinctive things that we need to mention need to be supported so they don't feel isolated, so they uh, have a sense that they belong to a profession, to a group, but they need to be supported also in terms of their technical competence, and they also need to be supported in terms of their professional, pedagogical competence and not left to their own devices to feel isolated, to feel that they don't know what they're doing, in the online environment and that they don't have the, the right kinds of skills to make the best use of those alternatives that we've been talking about. Thank you so much, Hala, for an excellent, really, really informative webinar this afternoon. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you so much, Tema, for making this possible. And to all of you who joined us this afternoon, you will see from the chat it's every, th every last Thursday of the month, 4 p.m. Egypt time. So we hope to see you all again at the end of July for the next in this series of Ask Hala webinars. So thank you very much. Have a very good afternoon and we'll see you this time next month. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.